Okay, good morning. Um, so Mark just talked about, a bit about what uh, digital transformation means uh, for your business. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means for IT and for application development. Um, now, when it, when, it, when it comes to IT, uh, digital transformation isn't, isn't just about continuing to deliver ever more operational efficiency. Um, it's really about IT becoming critical as the business evolves to de deliver more value through digital assets. It's almost um, cliche these days to say that every company is a software company, but it's actually true. You know, and, and Volvo is just one example. With their connected car initiative, they're actually changing in a fundamental way the way that they <coughs> deliver value to their customers. And even among car manufacturers, they're not alone in this regard. <coughs> of course, traditional IT functions still remain, right? We have email, MRP systems, ERP, uh, HR, CRM, and so on. <coughs> but what we're seeing is that, uh, to a large degree, these systems that um, are critical to the, to the functioning of the business but don't provide differentiation are actually becoming the purview of the SaaS providers. So you, know, you go to uh, Workday, you go to Salesforce, and you effectively uh, rent that software. <coughs> so what's happening here is what we're seeing is that IT is evolving from being a cost center um, to really being central to delivering the, you know, the services, the APIs, and the applications that actually enable new business models and uh, allow the company to differentiate itself on, on, based on software. So what this means is actually we're going to be delivering more software, not less, over the coming while. Um, and this, in turn, is driving some very significant changes in, in how IT delivers and manages and integrates um, both applications and data. And in turn, is driving changes into the platforms that are used for development um, and the platforms that are used for deployment. And we're not just talking about the Ubers and the Netflix of the world here, right? It's, it's established companies like Volvo that are actually going to have to uh, uh, evolve. So this is a journey. And everybody's starting in a different place. And a you know, reasonable question to ask is, OK, where, you know, where, where, where are you on this journey, on this continuum? Um, you know, we talk to a lot of customers, and we hear pretty consistently that people understand you know, the drivers in, in our market, in, uh, in their particular markets, or in the industry at large today. Uh, but they find themselves constra constrained or, or even stuck. And when you dig a little bit deeper, what you find is that they're, they're really constrained by the, by the fact that they're actually trying to build modern applications using the architectures, the processes, and the platforms that were relevant for the last generation of applications that tended to be fairly large monolithic apps uh, delivered on you know, long uh, release cycles and really, were really meant to last for 20 years, not 20 weeks. So there are really three, I would say, imperatives uh, to digital transformation. The first one is time to market. You know, if, if you can't get your, you know, your API or, or your new application or your, your, your new service um, out the market, you can rest assured that some competitor will. You know, it could be somebody you know about or some competitor you've never heard of. Um, but but you know, getting to market quickly is, is, is important. Now, of course, you have existing applications, as Mark alluded to, and a lot of those aren't going away. Uh, and so you, know, you have to build more software, but you somehow have to you know, bring these, these applications forward, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so in effect, what you're, what you're going to be doing, have to do is actually, as usual, do more with either the same or fewer resources. Um, and of course, you know, the, the other thing is you need to uh, assume that you're going to be operating in an environment and in a culture of continuous change. Right? This could be new business models that you know, your business comes up with or are somehow foisted upon you by competitors. It could be new technology that uh, will, uh, you know, if adopted, will allow you to get the kind of the, the speed and the, the, the efficiency that, that you're looking for um, or new processes and whatnot. Um, so it could, you know, let, get, let you get the speed and the agility, but also importantly, uh, um, you know, Staying current with the te te technology, adopting new technologies, are just gonna, what is what is, will help you attract and retain the talent, the, the programmers and the developers and the architects that you need to actually deliver on this, on this promise. So where can you start? Well, you know, probably not going to you know, drop a bomb, blow the whole thing up, and you know, re-architect everything as microservices, right? So you're going to start in a, you know, in, a measured, in a measured way. But if you, you know, just kind of do the simple thing, you know, spin up a team, adopt some new technologies, you know, deploy some stuff on, on Amazon, great. But you've now solved the problem for this application, but what about the one after that? What about the next rev of this application? What about the, the application after that one? And what about when these, these apps have to talk to each other and so on? So what we, what we uh, believe is that you really need to embark on this journey in, in the context of a larger plan uh, that will enable what we like to call continuous innovation. And, this is what we're going to be talking more about today. 
So the reality of digital transformation is that you can't really consistently deliver and, you know, and integrate and manage this next generation of applications with the, you know, the architectures and the processes and um, the platforms that were relevant for the last generation. Um, but you do have existing applications that need to be brought forward. You know, these aren't you know, brownfield nor are they legacy applications. They're still critical to your business. They can be leveraged in, in your new application, in this world of, of new applications. Um, so what you need is a conscious strategy that will enable the, you know, the, the speed and efficiency and agility that you need uh, while you know, uh, having this, co this, co this coexistence and, and being able to move forward. So this is going to involve some, some you know, evolution in, in your architecture. You know, uh, evolving from building uh, monoliths to you know breaking up monoliths and building up uh, you know a, an architecture based on on microservices. <clears throat> As you do this, what you realize is that you know traditional waterfall uh, pro uh, development processes don't really work that well and and uh, don't don't give you the speed and the agility that you're looking for. <clears throat> so your your development processes are going to evolve. Um, necessarily to you know more agile processes ultimately you know full DevOps and of course the the platforms that you use both for development and for uh, for deploying these applications um, as well as the underlying infrastructure are going to have to evolve along with it so we'll talk about each of these in turn but it's but it's really important to step back and you know always keep in mind the, the, the imperatives, right? You're, we're, the reason we're doing all of this is, isn't because it's cool or because, well, I mean, it is cool, but that's not why we're doing it, right? Uh, the reason we're doing this is we're really trying to get to, you know, the, the, the kind of speed and the kind of efficiency and the kind of agility that we need to respond to today's market demand. So I'm going to keep coming back to that because there's a lot of trade-offs involved in, in, you know, moving to microservices and all this, and the driver and the real imperatives is, is you know, doing things quickly. So let's talk about um, architectures for, for a minute. You know, traditional architectures um, over the last, uh, you know, for enterprise apps over the last 20 years or so, uh, you know, involved delivering you know, a single monolith delivered generally by a, you know, a good sized team. Uh, you know, this is a completely self-contained thing. You know, has, has you know, the, the, the UI, all the business logic, persistence, all of the, the pieces, parts that you, that, that you need. Traditionally, <coughs> um, you know, as I said, is a self-contained thing. Not necessarily, you know, doesn't necessarily have a lot of ways for, you know, connections to the to the outside world. Um, but, you know, over the, I would say at least the last 15 years, the you know requirements have actually evolved for uh, having uh, you know, greater integration between applications and actually not requirements, expectations really, right? For having you know greater integration between applications and actually building composite apps. So. Kind of what I would already say is the first generation uh, solution to this problem was service-oriented architecture. Pretty sensible approach, right? You take capabilities of existing applications, expose them as services, and then use those services as the means for you know, integrating applications and data and maybe even building composite apps. Where SOA kind of falls short, though, is in a couple of fronts. Generally speaking, the, you know, the technologies and the, uh, that used to, to implement these, these services, these interfaces, tended to be brittle in the face of, of change and tended to be somewhat more difficult to adopt you know, from, a, from a technical perspective. And you know, the, the, other, the other piece of it is that, that the, the vehicle used to actually deploy and implement these services, the enterprise service bus, pun kind of intended, uh, was, was, you know, became a monolith onto itself uh, and kind of stood as an impediment to the kind of agility that you're, that you're trying to achieve um, uh, in the first place. So microservices uh, you know, kind of represents the, the next iteration of this approach. The idea behind microservices is that each one is a self-contained piece of software, solves a problem, you know, a, a bounded problem, and solves it hopefully well, um, built by a team that owns the thing soup to nuts, you know, from development all the way throughout deployment and production. Um, each microservice manages its own dependencies. So one of the, one of the you know one of the pro, you know the things that you run into with with large, when you have these sort of large monolithic systems, and I've you know, anybody who's kind of worked in this realizes this is that you have some piece of the system that <coughs> you know encounters a bug or needs a new feature in some in some dependent uh, library. And you know some other pieces. Is, some other piece of the system is dependent on on a, on a different bug that are actually being in place that needs to work. So so kind of managing these dependencies uh, becomes nightmarish. Um, so uh, you know the idea here is that is that these microservices are are you know 
fully contained. They manage their own life cycle. They rev on their on their own cycle. Um, and the key and key to all of this is um, that they agree. You know, the teams agree on um, the. I've got stuff moving in front of me here. Um, so the, the, team, the, the teams agree on the APIs, on the interfaces, right, and, and the contracts between these, these microservices. So having, having, having done, and when we talk about APIs here, generally speaking, we're talking about RESTful, uh, RESTful interfaces, right? Um, not to say that messaging and other te technologies don't have a, uh, a role to play, but when, you, when we think microservices, you know, we're generally talking uh, REST. Um, so, you know, we, we have this sort of API-based, um, model of, of interaction, uh, you know, each of these guys, you know, runs independently now and, and can be deployed independently. So not only can you get kind of parallelism in your, in your development, but when it comes time to deploy, you're actually deploying, you know, each microservice as a self-contained unit and, you know, kind of leading the witness a little bit in containers uh, where each of them can scale independently. So if you need, um, you know, if your shopping cart is getting hit, hopefully, a lot, and you know, you scale up your shopping cart service, uh, but if your cross-selling recommendation service is handling the load just fine, you don't need to scale that. So what that lets you do is actually manage your, your, your uh, compute resources a lot more efficiently and let, lets you get, um, lets you get the, uh, you know, higher density. So in this world, applications are, you know, consist of essentially providing a user experience and then composing these, these various microservices. You know, the next application uh, is, you know, can, you, can reuse existing microservices. So you get reuse at that level um, and, you know, bring on, you know, and compose them in a different way and provide a different user experience, maybe bring in some new services that provide the unique value for that particular application. So another, uh, uh, interesting and, and, and uh, good thing about uh, sort of these API-based architectures is that it encourages, uh, you know, the use of third-party services where they're appropriate. Remember, we want to go for speed and agility and, and, you know, provide differentiation. So if you can use a third-party service for, I don't know, uh, you know, user management or, um, <coughs> or uh, some kind of location services, you know, you shouldn't be rolling your own. If, uh, you know, billing, for example, you know, you can, if you can avail yourself of a third party service, you know, you should absolutely do so and focus your team on, on what they, alongside this uh, software architecture, um, you know, the underlying, the architecture of the underlying infrastructure is also going to have to evolve. And we see this actually evolving from proprietary to open software uh, in order to be able to provide that, you know, a, a, a consistent platform across, you know, your physical, virtual, private, and, and public cloud footprint. You know, doing this is what makes app, applications portable across all these, um, these, these various environments. And here we're talking both about stateful and stateless applications, right? You, know, you need to be able to you know, leverage existing apps, kind of bring them into the same world um, and, uh, as you move forward. So, and this isn't just, uh, just us talking. Um, so in a, a, a recent survey, early 2016, of IT decision makers, um, IDC found that a full 90% are actually planning on, a, on, on living in a multimodal world where they have stateful and more modern stateless applications <coughs> coexisting. Um, they're actually planning, as, as Mark uh, uh, talked, to about it, talked about as well, um, on deploying across a hybrid cloud fabric. And they expect to have common um, management and automation tools that kind of span their entire footprint. So, this, this, what's happening here is we're making a trade-off, right? We're, we're, um, we're trading off on the one hand uh, to get you know, the speed and the efficiency that, that we talked about before, but frankly, we are introducing some extra complexity in the system, right? We're talking about microservices, distributed, you know, more distributed computing, um, you know, things scaling up and down in, independently. Really cool stuff, but it, it, it does add a measure of complexity. And you know, having, having you know, common underlying platforms, common you know, management and automation across your entire footprint is one of the ways to kind of mitigate this, uh, this complexity and make it possible to, to move forward um, overall. So alongside your, um, the, the architecture, as I said, proce uh, processes are gonna have to evolve. You know, um, if, you're, if you're living in a world where you have, I don't know, six, nine month development cycles, then a linear process where you, know, you do upfront analysis, uh, you know, developers go off and develop stuff and you know, pass it off to, to, to QA is testing it and then kind of launch something over the wall at, at, the, at, at the poor ops guys along with you know, six pages of single space, uh, you know, do this, do that, twiddle this knob and twiddle this other one the other way. Um, 
you kind of have that luxury. But the reality is that, you know, for any of us who've actually worked in environments uh, like that or, you know, manage teams, um, what you realize is that there, there is inefficiency in that. Yeah, you have this long life, uh, this long development cycle, but there's inefficiencies in that, right? So you do your upfront analysis, chances are you're gonna miss some stuff. Developers will go off and do the best they can. They're gonna you know, deliver some software. Obviously, there's gonna be bugs in it because we're all human, but more importantly, there's gonna be you know, gaps in, you know, functional gaps, like, oh, we didn't think of that, or no, that's, that isn't what we meant, right? That's the classical kind of a thing. And then, of course, you toss it over the wall, and you know, food fight ensues about how difficult it is to, to, um, to deploy. So, um, so the idea is to move to a, a, you know, a, a more agile process that, that, that you know, enables much quicker iteration. Um, and you know, bringing in the operations people uh, you know, it takes, it to, it takes it to the next level. This is what we're talking about with DevOps, right? So the idea is that you, know, you, you automate everything. So you have, not only do you have you know, your, your, your build, um, you know, your automated tests, but we're talking about you know, configuration, uh, deployment scripts, everything. And the idea is you know, tying all these together with, with you know, like a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline, you know, gives you that repeatability and actually allows you to iterate much more quickly. And you know, if, if, there, if, if what's needed in order to actually run this thing in production is a hairball, you're gonna find out about it really, really early, okay? And it'll get fed back. And you know, the other piece is we're talking about you know, automating <coughs> everything. Well, um, you know, in this world, everybody's a programmer, right? Every, you know, whether you're you know, writing Java code or scripting or writing YAML, whatever, everything's a programmer, everything is checked into source control. Um, and so you have, you, you know, you kind of have a traceability as well as to, you know, how, how things are moving along. So a couple, a couple of questions that are reasonable to ask is, okay, well, are we trading off any rigor here is one question. And the other question is, at the end of the day, is, does it work? So on the rigor front, um, what I'd say is this. Um, you know, we talked about the fact that everything is, is, has to be automated. Um, and, and you can iterate very quickly and you have repeatable processes. Um, so what I would say is that, is that you, know, you definitely have rigor in this process. If you see how teams you know, operate in this environment, um, you know, there, there's, there's code review, there's full traceability, you know, uh, using your, your uh, issue tracking system and, you know, history of, of everything, right? Um, so the, the, except the, there is rigor, but it's appropriately applied to the process. And on the does it work front, <clears throat> you know, in a, in a 2015 article, um, McKinsey uh, reported that uh, companies that adopt agile methodologies have been able to, on average, reduce the time from uh, development, you know, getting stuff from development into production. Uh, from an average of 89 to 15 days, which is just 17% of the original time. So these processes do work. Um, but you know, the impor the, the, another important thing to keep in mind here is that DevOps isn't just about processes and technologies. You know, certainly you need those to support that. There's, there's the cultural shifts that need to happen in terms of empowering teams and empowering developers that are really important. And again, those also have uh, you know, aspects of mitigation that, that we're gonna be talking about. Alongside your development processes, your, the processes that you use to you know, manage your infrastructure are also gonna have to evolve. Uh, and again, this is gonna require high degrees of automation, right? You're talking about you know, a footprint that's spanning you know, everything from, from bare metal out to the cloud. So automation is, is, is critical here. Um, in order for this to work at scale, you also need the ability to, to gather and analyze even more data and, and understand what's, what's, uh, what's, what's going on in, in your world. So having an integrated view of all of this stuff is, is, is critical. So Splunk, for exact, example, is automating um, changes to their cloud environment using Ansible Tower. So they're using Ansible playbooks to you know, automate repetitive tasks, whether they're you know, long running tasks or scheduled jobs. Um, Auto scaling or, or application installation. What <clears throat> the basic idea here is is that you know as you have things in production, you're going to you know uh, realize that you have standard operating procedures for dealing with various things, and, and you know rather than documenting them um, on a, on a wiki, which is step number one, you know better that better to actually code them up, have them in source control, and you know now you have repeatability of your process, and you know and, and measurability and you can you know fix bugs and treat it just like code right so on the platform side so the platforms that you're using for development and for for deployment um, are also going to have to be um, uh, you know, move to be cloud native uh, and really you need consistency here between you know across your from development all the way out to production where you know across your private and public cloud environments as well 
uh, you know, to do this stuff, you know, create microservices, use APIs, do all this really cool stuff, um, you know, tie in mobile devices and all that. Um, you know, automation is, is, is really criti critical, but your teams, your DevOps teams, actually have to work in environments that mimic production so that, that you know, when you actually pop something out in, into production, you have a reasonable, you know, you have a much higher probability that it's actually going to work and so on. Um, so the other piece here is, again, we're going for speed and agility, right? Self-service is key. You can't have developers, you know, waiting days or weeks for some piece of, you know, compute or storage or some kind of network config to, to, uh, to happen. So self-service is really critical, of course, with, you know, some level of, of you know, control and, and governance on top of it. So the platform on which you're doing this stuff you know, is going to require a, a rich set of runtime services as well as application de uh, uh, development services. So what I mean here is you know, everything from you know, uh, messaging, API management, you know, distributed tracing, log aggregation, um, uh, you know, gathering of metrics. You know, uh, this is going to be a, a repeating theme here, is, but part of the way you can move fast is if you measure everything. Um, and actually be able to visualize it and not only see how your, your um, software is, is behaving, but also you can actually measure the effectiveness of your, of your development teams. Continuous improvement is, a, is, a, is, a big, is another big theme here, right? You know, get feedback, how long does it take to go from, you know, from some, the time you check something in to, or you push something out to, up, to, up to your Git repo to the time it actually can make it in, into, into production. So underlying all of this, um, you know, your new infrastructure is going to have to rely on consistent platforms across both your traditional and new deployment footprints. Um, you know, having a common platform like this is, is what create, allows you to create common environments, use common tools, common processes, common expertise, you know, ac across the entire um, hybrid cloud fabric. So this is how enterprises use Linux and why RHEL is in, in the whole family of products is, is so valuable. And this is actually the, 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 the key concept of open hybrid cloud that is really critical uh, to digital transformation, we believe. As we've seen, the, the you know, adopting um, you know, microservices-based uh, architecture, architectures will, will actually let you, you know, move more quickly in a, in a, in a more agile fashion. Um, but these things are interrelated, right? You think of them, my, my visual is, you know, there's, there's knobs that you turn. You can start turning one of the knobs. You can, you know, start evolving your, your process, <coughs> or you can start, you know, moving to, to microservices. But eventually, at some point, the other, it's gonna, the other ones are going to have to lock in and start, start moving in, in tandem. So, you know, as you, <coughs> your architecture um, evolves to be more microservice-y and, and API-based, your processes are going to have to evolve to, to be more agile and, and, and ultimately full DevOps. And then, you know, you, you're going to need a platform that's going to that can support, you know, existing uh, 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 Java workloads as well as new microservices workloads and, and, um, and mobile applications. Um, you know, containers, uh, Linux containers, are, are really the, the key enabling technology for, for microservices. Um, but without uh, a way to orchestrate and, and manage them, you know, you're, you're not going uh, you're not going to be able to really gain, gain the benefits of using them at scale. And of course, uh, you know, storage, <coughs> storage has to span your, your, um, your um, entire fabric, right, from, from physical all the way out to, uh, to public clouds. And then management consoles need to provide a, a common view. So this isn't going to be easy. Uh, and as we said, not, not every application is going to make, make the leap. But you know, we've, we've seen customers do this, and it, um, you, know, you, can, you can start, for example, by uh, uh, take, taking, uh, you know, exposing capabilities of a certain app as, as, micro, as, as microservices, using those microservices to, to build uh, new, app, uh, new applications, eventually mi in a, you know, migrating um, more functionality into, into microservices and kind of retiring that, that capability from, from the monolith. There's a pattern called you know, choking the monolith, I believe. Um, you know, this is actually made easier if you can take, you know, if your existing application is running on, on EAP and then and is, you can, you know, run EAP apps on OpenShift, for example, and now you have your traditional application and your modern applications running in the, in the same fabric, right? And that, that just makes that, makes that easier. So there's a lot there, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, process and culture and, you know, there's certainly a lot of technology. Um, 
but the good news is that Red Hat actually does have you know, the complete stack. Uh, you know, at Red Hat, you know, people talk about Linux as being our, our cloud native platform, but there's really a lot more to it than that, right? It's OpenShift is really the, um, the, that common fabric between your private and public clouds, right? It's based on RHEL. Um, so it provides things like you know, self-service of provisioning uh, self-service provisioning of, of compute and network and storage resources. Um, so it enables, resources, uh, enables microservices based on Linux containers. It takes, it takes care of the orchestration that I was talking about before. And as we uh, talked about earlier, has built-in support for you know, CI-CD pipelines. Our middleware platforms like uh, JBoss CAP, 3Scale, Fuse, and so on, all run natively on, um, on OpenShift. Um, and of course, underneath all of this is RHEL. Uh, and RHEL isn't, isn't uh, just the core operating system, it's also the foundation for things like, uh, like uh, Red Hat Virtualization, Atomic Host, and the OpenStack platform. So th these, these platform solutions actually span all of your environments and give you that common way to, to build and deploy these applications that we've been talking about. When you kind of see the, 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 big, the, 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 bigger, the bigger picture and kind of think through all of the pieces that have to, uh, that have to come into place, um, it certainly, as we said, doesn't isn't easy, but perhaps it's a little bit less uh, daunting. So, what I'd like to do is, is walk through just a, you know, a couple of uh, simple examples of what a process like this might, might look like in practice. And we're going to start on the development side. And I'm going to pick a, a very cliche uh, example. So suppose you have a, you know, an application out in the field, uh, or you know, in the market, whatever, and uh, you know, the business decides that you know, it needs a new cross-selling recommendation engine so that uh, uh, you know, the app can, can provide cross-selling recommendations because they want to increase the average sale price. So, um, you know, the first step, step here is, you know, this sounds like a really nice little bounded domain for, for, um, for a microservice, right? You send in a SKU, you send in a user profile, and, you know, out pop some number of recommendations based on, you know, business rules and, and, and other data. So the first step here is, you know, define the API. So, you know, what's the contract that this microservice has to, has to fulfill? What are the constraints on the, on, the, on, on the SKU's user profile? What fields need to be in there and so on? Um, and, and what is it going to, you know, ship back? Um, having done that, the, the team that's building the app can be off and running. So we've, we've, uh, we've achieved that loose, that loose coupling. They can go off, they can develop it, they can, they can actually mock the, the service. In fact, they can take their app and push it into staging and maybe even into production if they have a feature flag, for example, that, that disables the cross-selling. Um, uh, or if they have use a, a reasonable thing, which would be a fallback strategy, if some microservice isn't available, you, know, you, you can actually you know, have the application say, oh, service isn't responding, I just, I'm not going to fail, I'm just not going to provide a, a, a cross-selling recommendation. So we've achieved that decoupling that we were talking about. Each of these teams can go off and run on their own. So let's come back to the microservices guys. Um, so first step along the way is you know, figure out what technologies you're going to bring to bear for the problem. One of the key tenets here is that uh, teams are empowered to make technology and other decisions as long as they satisfy their contract and they're you know, delivering, delivering on what they're supposed to deliver. Now, of course, there's going to be constraints on that, right? What, what, what is the expertise? You know, who are the people on the team, and you know, are there any sort of standards or other you know, reasons why you know, a particular um, enterprise might want to dictate one standard or another? So, but within those bounds, they're they're picking their technology. So, <clears throat> let's say we have a, some you know, Java E heads on this team, so they're going to use EAP. We talked about business rules, so they're you know, likely going to bring BRMS into the into the um, into the mix. Chances are they're going to have to reach in and do some integration and you know, grab some data and you know, massage it around in order to actually you know, be able to apply, the, apply these rules. So likely Fuse is going to come in there and you know, we kind of want this to be quick. So you know, an in-memory data grid wouldn't be a bad idea, so they bring in JBoss data grid. So next step is, okay, well, what are they going to deliver? You know, well, they're going to, the, ultimately what they're going to, what the artifact that, that will be deployed is going to be um, a Linux container. Um, you know, it, as I said before, that really is the enabling technology um, for, for microservices, right? So starting with a, a trusted container image, the build is going to layer on the, you know, the, the application and, and its dependencies and essentially create this, this immutable image that can then be, you know, deployed across, 
across your, uh, uh, your entire fabric there. So we believe that the best foundation for containers as well, right? You're already using it in production, it's stable, it's secure, and it provides that consistency across <coughs> all of your environments. And we also have REL Atomic Host, which has actually been um, re-architected specifically for containers. So the uh, you know, developers are off and running now. Remember we said that they're, you, know, you want to create a, you know, a, as much consistency as possible from development all the way out into production. So it's entirely likely that they're running OpenShift Container Local on their laptop. Right now this is a, you know, a single node um, OpenShift cluster. It can run, they can run on a laptop and you, know, you, you can build your container, test it in the context of, of, the, of the container platform, you know, do whatever it is that you, that you need to do. Right? Um, so at some, at some point, <coughs> you know, they'll be pushing uh, code changes up to their team's Git repository. At that point, CI/CD pipeline is going to pick it up, you know, run the builds, uh, deploy it out into a, a you know a test or staging environment, and start running tests. Right. So you're going to be running, um, you know, the the the, the staging environment is going to mimic your your deployment environment. So you can do you know scale testing, you can do penetration testing, might even do some uh, manual testing, and also you know integrate you know, just you know look look at how things operate. Uh, at a system level. So at some point, you know, you're going to decide, okay, we've got something that's good enough to push in production. Key, a key point here is you're trying to go fast, you're trying to iterate fast, you're trying to get feedback fast. So you don't actually, it doesn't, I mean, it obviously can't fall over and die and drag down your entire system, right? But you, the goal here is to get something into production as fast as possible and start measuring the effects. Remember, the, you know, the, the business goal was to increase the average sale price. So get something into production. Maybe your, your business rules aren't, aren't finely tuned, but you, know, you, you, you can actually start, you can start measuring, right? And then iterate on the, on, the, on the rules and iterate on the, whole, on the whole thing. It doesn't have to achieve perfection before it, it starts getting used. You know, and, and you can use d different strategies um, to, you know, uh, to have some, you know, like canary releases and so on, and, and uh, to, to try, or A-B testing, right, to try uh, experiments, you know, so some fraction of your requests will go here, some fractions of requests will go there. So your, your CI-CD pipeline is going to take the exact same container, right, it's not rebuilding anything, it's the exact same container image, and push it out into your production environment, uh, at which point any sort of, you know, specific config will be injected into it, but you know the, the, the topology is essentially the same, right? You got the same HA setup, the same storage setup, all of that stuff. Networking is is the same. So in production, you'll be running OpenShift Container Platform, which can run you know on on uh, on your on your private uh, cloud as as well as uh, on any of the uh, public cloud providers. So now you, you, we've seen the at a high level, of course, the the process for you know defining a, a new microservice, how we we have the the we can achieve parallelism how we have an automated pipeline that's taking, you know, taking the code, building the container and, and you, know, run, you know, doing the testing and pushing it out into production. This is kind of, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about modern application development. So now we have a working application in production. Um, so we're kind of, you know, entering the next uh, stage of its, of its life cycle, which is the, you know, the maintenance side, right? And this is going to be a more, you know, ops heavy kind of, Part of the part of the talk. So, on the ops side, yeah, what's the biggest concern? Well, security, right? Nothing is going to be more important to the to the reputation of, of of your business. So, how does how does security impact you know container based microservices architectures? Well, it's really what's in the container and what's on your host that matters, right? So, you know, are you building off a trusted base image? Do you know the provenance of all the software on on your base image? You know, do you have consistent, you know, uh, you know, is there consistency at the OS level across all of the hosts uh, so that you know for sure that the container image that you build will run consistently across your, your environment? Uh, do you have the latest patches and updates and, and you know, how are you going to actually, you know, get them and, uh, and apply them? So by using uh, certified containers and, you know, and hosts from, from Red Hat, you know the answer, right? So we're your trusted source for both both the container images and um, and the and the and the hosts and security fixes and whatnot are, are you know come as part of your subs uh, subscription. So obviously you can't elim eliminate every threat, um, but you know this uh, you, you need rapid response and this is where our security teams uh, uh, come in, right? They actually prepare you for the real world and, and make it make it able make you better able to cope when there is a vulnerability. 
So let's say there is some kind of security vulnerability. Say it's um, Heartbleed that um, came out, of, I think it was 2014, or could be any other cool names like Shellshock or Venom, or you know, we could actually even be talking about a regular you know, uh, patch release update kind of a thing. But once the security issue is known, you need management and automation software that'll actually help you identify you know, the, the, the relevant containers that need to be updated. You know, that's where uh, you know, management solutions like you know, satellite cloud forms and, and so on uh, come in. So having, having identified affected containers, you, know, you obviously need to get them, get them fixed and, and, and redeployed. Now here's a real key, uh, a key thing. You're not gonna actually patch a running container. Right? What you're gonna do is actually make the fix that you need to make and check it into source control. So whether that's changing your base image, changing a dependent, an application dependency in, uh, in, your, in, your, um, in your POM files, or you know, fixing a bug that, that your own uh, developers introduced, um, you know, you're gonna go through the exact same process and use the exact same pipeline. Remember we said this is a single integrated process. So you make the change, push it into your Git repository, you know, it runs through your CI CD pipeline, testing, and you know, ultimately uh, you know, pushes the thing into production. At that point, you know, OpenShift is gonna be is, 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 is the, the platform that's actually gonna make it possible to kind of do, you know, do things like rolling updates or, or, or uh, blue-green deployments. However, you have, you have these, these upgrade pro, um, update policies set up. So as we've seen, this automated deployment and the, the integration of development and operations processes are, re are, are, are really important. But, but, ha but this DevOps approach actually requires the appropriate platform, it requires the appropriate underlying infrastructure. So it's really OpenShift that provides that common fabric that enables DevOps um, and microservices to be deployed at scale. Um, and this movement to DevOps and microservices also, as I said, means that um, teams and developers have to be more, more uh, empowered to make decisions. But as you know, power and responsibility actually is moving to, the, to developers, CIOs also need to manage risk. The answer uh, is that, that management and automation are really critical to this. Um, you have to be able to make and revert changes very quickly uh, in a consistent and a predictable and a secure manner across your entire fabric. Um, you know, depending on your applications and your business, we're talking about you know, weekly, daily, or even hourly updates across thousands of systems. Um, you, know, you can actually make this scale with your business by, by you know, using uh, uh, satellite to establish uh, trusted, uh, trusted content. Um, you know, using cloud forms, as I uh, mentioned a few times, to, to give you that visibility across your, your entire fabric. Um, Ansible Tower for automation and you know, using, using insights to actually you know, uh, scan and al uh, always be aware of you know, vulnerabilities that, that, may, that may arise. So this consistent common container platform from, from development all the way out to production that spans multiple private and, and public clouds um, is actually gonna let you innovate um, in a way and at a pace that no other offering from any company can match. You know, we've been focusing on developers at, at, uh, at Red Hat for a decade uh, since our acquisition, acquisition of JBoss uh, in 2006. And, and we're continuing to deliver on this, most recently with the release of JBoss EAP7, which actually has been uh, re-architected uh, for microservices uh, and is actually ready to help you run in, in, uh, in containers. Um, our middleware services like you know, integration and messaging and so on, as I said before, also um, you know, run natively on, on OpenShift and are, you know, are ready for uh, this new style uh, of architecture. And, and on, the, on the platform side, really, our, our, our focus at Red Hat has been on open source platforms for over 15 years, right? We, we know critical operations at scale for, for um, you know, all levels of, of complexity. Um, you know, RHEL powers large multinational corporations, you know, all over, you know, all over the world, obviously, including the majority of, of uh, the Fortune 500. Um, yeah, and we're continuing to, to, to innovate here. You know, with, with Cloud Suite, you can integrate your private and public cloud uh, footprints. Uh, Red Hat Innovation Labs is a really cool um, offering that will actually help you uh, develop better solutions faster and our services team will actually work with your, develop, with your teams so that you can understand the, the cultural and process uh, aspects of, of uh, moving to DevOps as well as the, you know, the technology and the infrastructure pieces. Uh, and with our recent acquisition of 3Scale, you can actually implement API management policies like you know, security or, or um, you know, rate limiting or even monetization for, for both internal and external uh, APIs. But you know, we're not talking 
just about the future here. We actually have customers that are doing this stuff today. Uh, you know, Paddy Power Betfair uh, actually built their modern architecture for high, for high volume uh, betting transactions. If, if you can actually, I'm not going to try to quote numbers because I'll get them wrong, but the, the number of hits they get and the number of transactions per day are, are staggering. Um, and they're, they're using you know, Linux and OpenStack. <coughs> Um, they've enabled the self-service for developers that we're talking about, and they've uh, fully automated their, um, their infrastructure. At Target, they're actually focusing a lot on the cultural aspects of DevOps, uh, which is a really important consideration um, as they, as they uh, work to you know, meet customer demands for a, a smooth you know, online to in-store shopping experience. And Amadeus um, is actually using OpenShift as their new cloud computing platform to automate and speed up uh, both operations and applications development, application development for both um, stateful as well as um, stateless applications. And they're using uh, EAP for all of their Java workloads. So this convergence of uh, development and operations and the new technologies that we're talking about simply would not have been possible without open source. And they're actually very familiar to, to those of us who actually worked in the open source community. Like Linux, they're making their way to the enterprise uh, and are actually going to help us evolve to the next generation of IT where, where we're building microservices based at um, applications uh, built using agile processes you know, with continuous integration, continuous delivery, all deployed on these multi, on, on multimodal platforms um, that span a hybrid cloud environment. Taken together, these are actually going to help us realize the promise of, of uh, full DevOps and usher in what we like to call the era of open continuous innovation. And, and only Red Hat has the offerings and the expertise to be your trusted partner in what we think is going to be a really exciting journey. Thank you. So um, everybody's ready to completely modernize all their applications this afternoon? We're good? Yeah. Um, it was interesting because he used Target as a customer reference. And, and obviously, they implemented our technology after they came to Canada. OK? It was an, we weren't part of that. So um, exactly. So. Um, so as you can see, it's, I think one of the key points, and Steph brought it up, I think Mark did, is that this isn't, this isn't future state for a lot of customers. This is their existing state. This is where they are now and where they're working to be right now. So I don't want anybody in the room thinking that this is wishful thinking. That was a few years ago. This is the reality of where applications are going. Um, there's some great, just to give you a couple examples here in Canada, we have a, an organization, a utility, a large one, that's going to migrate, is actually presently migrating all of their WebSphere applications from AIX over to JBoss, EAP, running in containers, managed by OpenShift. Running on bare metal rel atomic is the goal. Like from WebSphere AIX all the way to rel atomic containers, OpenShift, and JBoss. And they see it as better security, more manageable, higher performance, and much lower cost. So no, no far-flung ROI. These are real ROIs. So ROI was based almost entirely on reducing the cost, creating more security for their next-gen applications. So no, no far-flung, oh, I have this DevOps, which is great, but they were able to justify it just on good old-fashioned IT business rules. So, but uh, just to give you an example, and there's lots of other examples, there's two gentlemen I want to meet. I want you to meet. Um, again, Claude Reeves, I manage the enterprise named account business in Canada, but we also have Scott Sager. He's actually um, director of the financial FSI business in North America, which includes the five banks here in Canada. So if you're with one of the banks or you have any financial type challenges and that sort of thing, Scott is a great person to talk to. Been with Red Hat a long time. Just tremendous experience working in the financial world. And then we also have Richard Segay right there, who um, runs the public sector for Canada. So if you have questions around what have we do, been doing with the government, we're doing some great things across the country right now, across agencies, um, departments, ministries. Richard is a great resource to give you an idea of what's possible, how it's being used, and how you can make use of it. Because with the government, that's always one of the big challenges. Eh? How can you bring in those new technologies? So with that, we're actually a little ahead of schedule. So we're going to give you a little bit of time back to check your email, grab a coffee, grab a snack. I had a chocolate chip cookie, and it was exceptional. Um, 
the one key thing is that a lot of people were saying it was too warm, it was too cold in here. So um, we asked them to raise the heat for a while. Um, not true. And you can hear the air conditioning going right now, and the room's already cooling down. And by the time you come back in half an hour, I think we should be uh, we should be comfortable again. So keep all your clothes on. That's not the type of thing we're doing today. Um, have a great break. We'll see everybody at 11 o'clock.